Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bubbler Banter on the Bruce Sports Network, the show where we spout off about Wisconsin sports. I'm Josh Scheibe, and while my regular co-host, Ian DeMars, is down in Florida on vacation, I'm joined here in the studio by Ryan Thies. Welcome to the show, Ryan. Thanks Hello. for being here today. Yeah. Uh, care to tell our viewers a little bit, uh, who might not be as familiar with you, a little bit about yourself? Yeah, well, I'm Ryan Thies. I co-host the College Road Trip with Barry Nelson on Wednesday nights. We actually had a huge show last night going over... Uh, March Madness, uh, kind of a big deal around this time, mm-hmm. starting today. So today is like my Christmas. It is the beginning of all-day basketball, starting at 11 a.m. local time here, going all through about 11 p.m. So 12 hours, college bas- meaningful college basketball, I might I add. All right. Well, we're glad to have you here on the show. And Ian has graciously agreed to call in from sunny Florida for a brief time to comment a bit on our first couple of segments. How's it going, Ian? I see you've had some uh, success fishing down there. <laughs> yeah, I got a 25-pound permit yesterday, so that was nice. uh, one of the biggest fish I've caught in the past 10 years, so that was pretty nice. Well, and, great. Uh, thanks again, Ryan, for filling in for me this week. <laughs> yeah, not a problem. Well, we're glad to have you here, at least for the first couple of segments, Ian. Um, while it might be a little early to say that these are some of Bango's best, the Milwaukee Bucks are beginning <laughs> to make a case for it. They've won seven of the last eight games. They're now 33-34 and 34 on the season, seventh overall in the Eastern Conference. And while they lost in a big way to Memphis on Monday, 113-93, to 93, a game like that is seeming more and more like a fluke. You know, they had an exciting 97-96 win last night against the Clippers as Matthew Dellavedova yeah. and Greg Monroe. They crowded out Blake Griffin enough for him to miss his final shot. So what do you guys think of the Bucks right now? Ian, let's start with you. Any players in particular who draw your attention right now um i first off i want to say the bucks if you have noticed they actually have the best record in the eastern conference in their past 15 games they're gone 11 and 4 in those 15 games and like you said before they've won seven out of eight and like i like what the bucks have done recently by moving matthew delvadova back to the bench i feel like that's more of the role he wants to play just because mm-hmm. he gives you that quick spark right away malcolm brogdon is playing great this year and deserves to be starting for the Bucks. And Greg Monroe has adapted to that bench role really well and is definitely probably, I would say he's definitely top five in my opinion. If the Bucks make the playoffs, he's a top five uh, sixth man of the year candidate. All right, Ryan, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I really like the way the Bucks are playing right now, especially without Jabari Parker. That was a big loss for yeah. them. But they're, they got Chris Middleton back. He's playing very well. Uh, Tony Snell as well. He is impressing everyone mm-hmm. as as they just keep keep rolling here. And I think it's going to be a, a very good thing if they make the playoffs. Just either as the seven or the eight, you'd rather be the seven seed, so you don't have to mm-hmm. face the Cavs right away, right off the bat. But any playoffs yeah. <laughs> right now is a step in the right direction as they're mm-hmm. going for the future here. Um, but. I just really like the way they've been playing basketball, Elite. If they can just keep this string going along for the remainder of the regular season, they'll be in very good shape. Yeah, and uh, it looks like I, – I, I know we all are hoping that the Bucks make the playoffs, but they do have a really tough stretch to end the season. Now, mm-hmm. When I was watching the game last night, uh, ESPN was saying how I believe 11 of their last 15, 16 games are actually on the road. So that will be a tough stretch, I know – they, this weekend, I think they play the Warriors. That'll definitely be a tough game. Uh, I know they have to go to Boston a couple of times. They still have to go to L- LA, the, see the Lakers, the Kings, and the Trailblazers on their road trip. So it'll definitely be a tough stretch to end the year. But if they can manage to go 500 on the road the rest of the year and try and get the rest of their home wins under them, I feel like they'll definitely – hopefully get that seven seed, maybe even climb up to that six seed in the East. So this is one of these young teams that's really, really good. Do you think this might be one of the best young teams in the league, Ian? I definitely agree that it would, they would be one of the best young teams in the league. They're no longer the youngest team in the league. Right. I was watching the Trailblazers game before, and they actually are the youngest team now, surpassing the Bucks 
with some of the moves that they made. But the, with the way they're playing right now, you look at their starting lineup, they, they're starting two rookies in the lineup. So just by that means that they do have a very special team. And when they're healthy, they're going to be very dangerous, I believe, in the next year or two. Yeah, it's got to be the best younger teams in the NBA right now. The way that they're just all meshing together. Giannis, of course, doing what he does every game. Uh, something I also want to note about last night's game. They won without anyone scoring more than 16 points. And so it, it was something, a, a yeah. full team effort. Look, yeah, go ahead. You. Yeah, and if you look at the plus minus. If you look at the plus minus for them, all their starters had minuses except for Chris Middleton. Hmm. And then everyone on their bench had pluses. So for so really... them to win a game on the road with four of your starters having minuses, and that's pretty impressive. Yeah, it is. And, you know, you gotta, you got to kind of wonder um, moving forward here, are these guys going to be happy sticking around in Milwaukee? It's an exciting place right now uh, with the new stadium mm-hmm. being built and with this new young team coming in. Um, obviously, Giannis seems to be particularly happy here. He doesn't seem like he wants to, to <laughs> leave anytime soon. Um, but do you guys think that maybe he or any of the others might not want to stick around? Uh, if they've bought in so far with the coaching of Jason Kidd right now and the team as a whole. And I think it's just – a future thing. If the part of buying into this system right now is being on the team for quite some time to get the full rewards of the Bucks right now, um, yeah. you, you can't yeah. promise them that they're going to win the finals this season or maybe even the next season. But they're going to get better every season. Got a brand new arena coming up, a br- much much better team coming up as well. So I, I think that is a recipe for keeping players around. I mean, you're not going to, you can't keep everyone around. That's just not how it works, <laughs> but they're going to keep prop most people. Ian, yeah. What are your I thoughts? would have to agree with that. I would have to agree with Ryan on that one. I mean, if they thought that if some of their bigger pieces didn't think that was going to work out, they would have traded Greg Monroe by now. There were rumors that he was going to get traded last off season and he did it. There were rumors at the start of the season when they weren't really playing that well that he was going to get traded and yet he didn't. So I feel like that he's starting to realize that, hey, I can be that power guy off the bench. I can give them that spark and I feel like everyone else is starting to adapt to their roles. Even with when Tony Snell, I feel like next year when Jabari gets healthy, that Snell's going to move possibly to a bench role, even Middleton. But I feel like that when whoever does get moved to the bench at some point next year, they're going to adapt really well, especially you look at Snell, a great defender. He's shooting over 40% from three this year. And even Middleton, Middleton, if he goes to the bench, he could definitely be one of the favorites to win a uh, sixth man of the year. All right. Well, thanks for that, Ian. Let's, uh, let's move on a little bit into our Packers segment here. Over the past couple of weeks, we've seen quite a few of now former Green Bay players uh, packing their bags. Uh, Lacey, uh, Eddie Lacey, has now gone to Seattle. Um, TJ Lang has moved on as well. Are you guys frustrated at all with what we're seeing here of these these veteran free agents not being signed again by Ted Thompson and the Packers? (laughs) Um. I feel like frustrated is not a harsh enough word. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, when you lose some of your better players, it's definitely going to hurt. I thought Lacey for sure wasn't going to leave. And then when I saw that he went to Seattle, it definitely uh, shocked me, especially when they Seattle said that they would be okay if he got back up to the 240, 250 range because they want him to be more of a power back. And then you look at TJ Lang. It hurts when you lose someone that plays really well for you, but when you lose into a division rival, that's even worse. So those were definitely two hard losses. Uh, I did hear that they do plan on bringing back Devon House. Or, yeah, I believe, yeah, Devon House. So yeah, I think they I feel just like that's a good signing. Mm-hmm. I feel like that'll be a good re-signing. He can help mentor those young corners. And I know I'm not sure if we talked about it before, but Martellus Bennett, that's a cute I feel like that's an upgrade from Jared Cook in my opinion, a guy who can catch the ball, block uh for the running backs. So I feel like they are losing some key pieces, but Ted Thompson is starting to go out there and try to sign some bigger guys in. When you lose uh 
we saw that Eddie Lacy going to Seattle, and you look at Minnesota, they filled their backs, running back spot by signing Latavius or agreeing to deal with Latavius Murray that I saw this morning. So it, it's definitely possible now that Adrian Peterson could be in play for the Packers. That is possible. Do you, do you think that this uh, opens up uh, a, a better option for him uh, to come to Green Bay? Personally, I'm pulling for LeGarrette Blunt uh, to come to Green Bay. Mm-hmm. I think he'd be a great fit for their system. Yeah, I feel like either one of those guys would be a great fit. Uh, you could look at Doug Martin also as an example. I feel like if they could sign one of those three guys to be their running back, it would be beneficial for the Packers since they've had some issues at running back with either consistency or health the past few years. Mm-hmm. And once they get someone who can play at least 14, 15 games, get you over 1,100, 1,200 yards, get you touchdowns, help put the pressure off of Aaron Rodgers. That's definitely something they need. And getting a Peterson, Blunt, or a Doug Martin, in my opinion, would be the best thing for the Packers. Now, they have a lot of other things that they need to look at still, but they need to – because I don't – I like that they moved Montgomery to running back, but I don't think he's the long-term answer. No, I think he's – he would be – part of a one two punch situation. I don't think he can he I don't think he can stay there on his own. Mm-hmm. So I know you, Ryan, what were you thinking about it? Uh I I'm not the best on the Packers kind of news, but it there's mm-hmm. it opens up a hole. You lose Eddie Lacey and you gotta fill that hole. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether it's like Eric Plunt or Adrian Peterson or someone beyond that, there's still a hole you gotta fill. Mm-hmm. So who do you think? I know because we lost, uh, or the Packers lost T.J. Lang and J.C. Treader. Treader's a little easier to um, replace because you know Corey Lindsley came in last season after Treader got hurt. Mm-hmm. Lang, Lang though, he was a pretty integral part of that line. Do you think that there's anybody on the horizon who might be able to take his place? Well, I know last year we saw some of uh, Jason Spriggs, I believe, come in. He was more of that sixth guy that came in on the line. Now, he's usually traditionally a tackle, so I'm not sure if they would maybe transition him to guard or if maybe they try signing someone or maybe drafting someone to possibly fill that spot. But I think that if he's willing to maybe switch over to that guard spot, that would definitely be something to help out the Packers because I know when he did play last year, he wasn't – when you knew he was coming into the game, the Packers didn't really fall back in the whole line. They definitely were able to stay in put when he came into the game. And, you know, people give Aaron Rodgers a lot of much-deserved credit for, for the way that he played last season. But people don't remember that he's not the only one out on the field. You know, he needs help both from his line and from his receivers and his running backs. And this mm-hmm. seems like they're trying – it seems like they almost want Aaron Rodgers to do more with less uh, than he had last year, which it seems difficult to even mm-hmm. have less than last year in terms of the offense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so it's it, it's a little frustrating as a fan as well, just seeing yeah. a lot of these these veteran players going elsewhere. Mm-hmm. I mean, good for them. And, you know, here's <laughs> here's the thing. It's like any job in a way. It's like any contract. You don't... I don't think it's good to uh, expect any sort of loyalty necessarily just because you played for a certain team. Um, I don't think that a team needs to have loyalty to a player necessarily once the contract has run out. That's just my Mm -hmm. personal thought on it. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's definitely a tough situation, but I feel like if they're – I mean, it's tough for them when you see someone leave, but if they're getting good money – and the Packers aren't willing to give it to them, then I'm kind of happy that they're getting the money that they deserve. I mean, yeah, I look at when Kevin, when Kevin Zeidler became a free agent, I'm like, that if they lose Lang, that'd be the guy they go, I would want to go for. Mm-hmm. But you look at he ends up signing with Cleveland, and you seem like, why would you go to Cleveland? But if he's getting good money, right? then you can't really blame the guy. Yeah, that's just – that's that's – how it goes. It's like any other job, you know, if you get a better offer, then why not why not go there? So what yeah. do you think what do you think the Packers do? Uh Jeff asks on Facebook here, what do the Packers do to fix their defense? Obviously they've got to bring in some cornerbacks that are gonna help 
shore up the secondary. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, what else do you think they can do? Well, we did see that. I believe Dayton Jones, from what I saw, he agreed to go to Minnesota, so that would be another loss. So I feel like trying to maybe get – I know they're kind of young at the linebacker position, so maybe trying to either fill a spot at linebacker or to get another pass rusher. It doesn't have to be, like I said, it doesn't have to be a superstar, but I feel like they need to just get another veteran presence to fill one of those spots. Mm -hmm. It was a good thing that they did get House to come back, so that's definitely a good veteran to corner position, but I feel like either linebacker or a pass rusher, they need to – try to attract within the next couple of weeks. And then once you get that, if Adrian Peterson or LeGarrette Blunt's still available, then make a hard push for those guys. Sure. Yeah, it seems like they really need somebody to kind of to help Clay Matthews out, especially in the pass rush. And now with with Julius Peppers going elsewhere as well, uh, it seems like he's going to need – it seems like he's going to need some help, Clay Matthews. So (laughs) we'll see what happens with that. Yeah. (laughs) Well, uh, thanks very much, Ian, for being here on the show today. Enjoy sunny Florida. Please bring some of that weather back to Wisconsin with you. Enjoy fishing while we enjoy (laughs) shoveling. I'll try, Josh. Before you let me go, I do want to, since it is March Madness and it officially starts today, I do want to let the viewers know who I picked for my Final Four. Please do. I picked Duke. I picked Duke to win their region. Uh, The only one seed I have is the one that people think is going to lose first, and Gonzaga making the Final Four. I believe this is the year they finally get there. Then I have one of the hottest teams in the country, one of my favorite teams in Michigan, making it as a seven seed to the Final Four. And then we all know the story of the Ball family. I believe that they get there (laughs) in their region. And then my final pick, finals pick, I like Duke to defeat UCLA, because people had Duke at the beginning of the year. They were struggling. They're playing the right type of basketball now, and I feel like that they are the best team now in college basketball and will get that championship. So you're all about the trendy picks, about uh, how they're playing <laughs> in the conference tournaments, huh? Yes, I feel like yeah. that if you're playing hot, like when you get to that tournament, you're going to be playing especially well. Look at Look at USC yesterday. They – they played well in their tournament. They almost beat UCLA in the tournament, and they were down 17 points yesterday, and they came back to win that game. So I feel like if you're playing hot coming in, that you're going to uh, keep playing well. Let's. I know last year Michigan State, they were playing hot, and then they lost their first game. But I feel like this year the teams that are playing hot at the right time are going to play well in the tournament. All right. Well, thanks very much, Ian. Have a good vacation. All right. Thanks, guys. Take care. All right, well, let's move on into our next segment. The Brewers lost last night to the Rockies 4-5, to five, giving up two runs in the ninth that sealed the deal for Colorado. But they held their own against the Cubs the night before in a 7-7 tie. And we can't forget to talk about the Brew Crew blowout. They whipped the Mariners 24-3 to three in the most one-sided game I've heard of since I played chess against myself in grade school. Ryan, we've seen some interesting games for the Brewers so far in spring training. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I don't buy in too much about spring training scores, per se, more just individual performances, Mm -hmm. how hitters are seeing different pitchers in the early innings. Uh, Because once you get to later innings, it's more of the the deeper minor league guys that might have a chance to come up in, say, September. But uh, it's still nice to put up 24 runs. Uh, There's a 10-run inning that actually – kind of broke the scoreboard in Maryville um, (laughs) because the inning column only is enough for a single digit, so it just showed as a one, but it was actually 10 runs that inning. But um, Travis Shaw homered again. Uh, Newen Heist homered in that game as well. Mm -hmm. Um, All all the bats were just really hot that day, and it's a good feel-good thing too. It's You go home back to your – your spring training home, feeling good. Uh, you're positive about the season, and that's what the Brewers kind of need here. They need every positive uh, feeling they can get going into this season. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see um, how much of this this uh, they can carry over into the upcoming season. Yeah, uh, one thing I like to point out, too, is Travis Shaw. He's having a great spring. Currently, he's hitting 310. 
Uh, he's got two homers. One was in that 24-run game, mm-hmm. six RBIs, and uh, stole a base. He's really kind of putting out his best campaign to be the starting third baseman here on, on opening day for, for the Brewers. So any other standouts? Uh, of always, Arcia. Uh, he's Orlando Arcia is doing a great job. Um, j- as expected, and he's going to be in the infield wherever they put him in, in the middle infield. But um, Kirk Neuenheis as well, he, he's been decent. The catcher is the big question mark so far. Yeah. Um, don't really know who it's going to be. It, it's uh, just a, a big enigma mm-hmm. right now. And starting pitching, too. Who's, who's going to be the opening day starter, do you, do you think? Oh, I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, I don't even he's... know. I mean, it's <sighs> anybody they have right now could yeah. could do it, I think. Uh, one through five could be the opening day start. It's a very fluid throughout there. Do you do you have any predictions of who might start as pitcher or who might start as catcher? <laughs> I know this is a conversation it's, that's kind of – it's very nebulous it's right now. Yeah. Um, I don't, it, it, you could throw out any name for the pitcher. Like, I, I, like, I wouldn't even be surprised if they said Zach Davies. Starts for opening day. Uh, like that's how wide open <laughs> it is right now. Um, but I, I don't think you, you go deeper in there. Uh, Chase Anderson, I think he. I don't think he's good enough to be uh, that. He's more of a four-five starting pitcher here for the Brewers. But it's going to be a very interesting season. I think we can all agree on that. Very low expectations. Uh, I think Vegas has them around sixty-nine, seventy wins on the year um i think being positive i think they're going to surpass that but they really haven't proven anything so far there's just a lot of question marks out there well let me see here i had a link here okay well it seems to have disappeared so i'm just gonna <laughs> that's, skip that's how that. it works yeah it uh it seems to have disappeared here sorry about that folks technical difficulties <laughs> it, but it anyway. happens So, uh, let's just move on then, since I don't have that one anymore. Um, Let's see. We do have some other... All right, we've got a question from Jeff here. Uh, How much will it hurt the pitching staff not knowing the starting catcher? Um, Right right now, not as much. Because in spring training, they are throwing to almost every single catcher throughout the organization. Um, there's so many bullpen sessions going on right now, along with different games, split squad games. Not everyone is, is together. So they're kind of mixing it up right now, feeling it out, who they like. And that could be very beneficial to the pitchers and the catchers alike. Uh, but I don't think it it means too much against these pitchers. It's more of an in-season thing where they really build that pitcher-catcher relationship um, especially when you travel long distances on the road, um, usually room close together, spend a lot of time together. Um, that's when those relationships are born. All right. Well, then uh, let's move on into our March Madness segment. It has truly been madness in Madison and Milwaukee as the Badgers have been listed as a number eight seed, much lower than just about any of the hometown, hometown folks were thinking and the Marquette Golden Eagles are at number 10. People have been pretty angry about the Badgers in particular, especially considering that they beat Minnesota twice already, pretty handily. Uh, do you think they deserved a higher seed, Ryan? I don't think they deserved that high, but I understand the selection committee's thought process uh, for the eight seed, because if you look at how they looked in February, mm-hmm. it, it wasn't good, and that's when majority of the research the selection committee does. They don't just all of a sudden pick 68 teams on Selection Sunday at the mm-hmm. conclusion of the Big Ten tournament. That's not how it works. It's a long process that they go through, and majority of that process is through February, and that is the Wisconsin team they saw at that current point, and they felt like Wisconsin was kind of on the downslope. Minnesota started to get a little hot in February too, so that's why they got – the five seed. And there, there's the argument out there, too, that they're the Big Ten. Wisconsin was the Big Ten runner-up, mm-hmm. and they shouldn't be the eight seed. But they lost to the eight seed of the Big Ten tournament, Michigan, in that championship game. So if you want to argue about them being runner-up, they still lost to a um, 
eight seed Michigan team. Yeah, I think that I think coming into February, the the Badgers were twenty one and three, and they went to twenty five and nine. Yeah, um, meanwhile, Minnesota, I think, was fifteen and fifteen and seven, and they went twenty four and nine. So clearly, exactly, you know, things uh, that that's a very clear reason why you know the Badgers would have been seated lower than Minnesota. If Wisconsin would have had their February, say, back in November, or through their non conference schedule, right. had a slower start, and then started to heat up in February, they'd be a higher seed. And do you think that? Do you think that uh, records in terms of teams going head-to-head actually matter when it comes to it's selection it's, committee? It's situational. It's about when it happens and where it happens. Um, home court uh, score matters as well. Um, but it's just – you can see there's, there's a lot of changes that college basketball teams go through throughout a, a season, mm-hmm. as Wisconsin has just rightfully proved that that the February Wisconsin team is different than the January and uh, December Wisconsin team. It, it's just it's a different team um, playing against a different Minnesota team, too. Right. And so they got to kind of put a little bit of stock into that, how they play at certain times. And then the home court uh, advantage, even though Wisconsin beat Minnesota twice, um, I think when they when they seed it, it's not going head to head. Oh, because this team beat this team twice, they should be ahead. They they just go based off of record. Doesn't matter who it was up against the other seeds. They just seed it one through sixty eight. Do you think strength of schedule was a big factor too? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And the Big Ten, I, you can argue it was kind of a, an off year for them. They didn't have as big. Uh, Talent-wise, as, say, Michigan State has been or um, any other team. Purdue was the regular season champion. That hasn't happened in a while. And it maybe wasn't the best Purdue team that we've seen in quite some time. Uh, Iowa had another off year, even though they snuck in. No, they didn't get into the tournament. uh, But um, just the Big Ten overall this year. Not as good as they used to be. ACC has really dominated, yeah. and that's why they got nine teams in there. So how far how far do you think uh, the Badgers are going to go? I think they go around a 32 yeah, and then get bounced by Villanova. Okay. So be, being an 8-9 seed is really tough because even if you have a tough game to start out because you're paying, playing only one seed away from you, mm-hmm. and then if you win, you play the number one seed. And in this case, it's the number one overall seed in Villanova, who's only lost three games. Yeah, that's going to be it's going to be a very tough tough game. Now let's let's move on a bit to the the Golden Eagles. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think they deserve their seat? Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. Um, I, there hasn't been as as much uproar regarding that one because I think people it, generally consider that one yeah. to be pretty much what they it, ten or eleven would have yeah. been par for the course for Marquette. Um, they had a very bad closing argument against Seton Hall in the Big East tournament. Um, just didn't look good at all. They've had some bad losses, but also some big wins. They beat Creighton twice, beat Xavier. Um, mm-hmm. They got Butler at home one time as well. And then, uh, of course, Villanova. That was a big win. So it's really dependent on what Marquette team is going to show up. Uh, tomorrow, um, whether they live and die by the three pointer, and that is right. a very dangerous game <laughs> to play. It's a lot of fun, you score a lot of points, but their defense is just way up in the air. There's nothing solid there yet. Uh, South Carolina, they have a solid defense, so and they're going to be focusing on the perimeter defense because they know Marquette lives and dies by the three. Mm-hmm. So it, it's, it's a tough matchup for Marquette, but I think they win it by two points. Okay. And if they do show up tomorrow and if they do win tomorrow, how far do you think they'll go? Round of 32 again. Same. And then, 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 then they get bounced. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. That's kind of what I'm figuring, at least for Marquette. I don't know about, I don't know about the Badgers. I'd like to if, think they could go a little farther. See, it, you'd like to think that, but one, it's <laughs> Villanova. Right. And two, it's not that short of a memory of the February Badgers and how they looked. Very true. And a lot of those games were at home, too. And that Mm -hmm. was a tough pill to swallow there for Wisconsin. But it's just, I just can't bring myself to pick them over the number one overall seed. 
I, I'm, I feel like I'm pushing it by picking him over Virginia Tech even. Yeah, that, that's going to be the big, uh, the big bump in the road, as it were, to get over if they're going to get anywhere, I think. Um, but you know. it, it'll, it'll be nice. Last hurrah here for Nigel Hayes and Bronson Koenig. Mm-hmm. They've been a very integral part of Wisconsin. But I think just last year was the last run they were going to have as a group with Koenig hitting that. Buzzer beater against Xavier. I think Badger fans might want to hang on to those memories uh, this season. I, I really don't think Badgers are going to go that far. All right. Well, let's see here then. We're going to move on into our next segment then. It looks like a Steelers player might be the belle of the ball in Waukesha. After Ava Tarantino, a student at Waukesha West High School, tweeted at Le'Veon Bell asking him to be her prom date if she got 500 retweets, Bell up the ante, saying for 600 retweets, he'd do it. And, well, Tarantino got uh, more than three times that. She got over 1,800 retweets, and I think it's still counting now. Um, so Bell basically said, well, a deal's a deal, and now it's just a matter of getting permission from the school for it to happen. So what do you think about that, Ryan? Did you hear about I, this at all? I didn't until just now, but I... It's kind of a popular thing that people ha- have been to high schoolers. Mm-hmm. Uh, mo- it's mostly been guys asking, say, Kate Upton to to prom a certain number of re- retweets. Um, but it, it's a good story to get um, this, the prom date yeah, hooked and, up here locally. And I think that from what I was reading, Waukesha West has a they, they ha- the school district has an age limit of nineteen yeah. for prom guests, mm-hmm. which. Is obviously understandable. But, um, they said that they're reviewing the request before they make a decision. They might make an exception, though. Um, they've got th- to. This rule's been in place for decades, they yeah. said, with no exceptions. It's However, not some rando coming off of the street. Right. It's this someone is, who actually has a reputation that they're trying to hold on to. Right. They're not going to ruin it at uh, a prom in Wisconsin. That would, that would be the hope, yeah. And Bell uh, said that he plans to bring his mom to the dance, um, mm-hmm. as well as his girlfriend, and Ava said uh, that she's going to be doing her makeup. So that'll be oh, kind of wow. cool. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, you get, the school has to let this happen. If they say no to this, there's going to be more bad press and towards the school. It's just a very win-win situation for everyone. If they say, yes, we're going to make an exception here, we can allow this NFL football star to attend our prom. Uh, that's going to get a lot of exposure to the school, feel good story for this girl, and just all around good stuff going on. It'd be very disappointing if they said no. Yeah, it would be. It would, you know, and like you said, this is becoming a, a more and more common thing, especially with the rise of, of Twitter and social yep. media in general. Um, it's, it's been a, a, a very interesting thing seeing this happen more and more. Um, so it would be interesting to see it come to it's, Waukesha. It's, it's, it it's how the world is I, now, I, I guess. Because I don't know that anything um, in like this has, has happened in Wisconsin. Um, I'm not entirely sure on that. I'd have to check again. Um, I'm sure people have tried but not had the success yeah. uh, of this case. Well, um, sorry. I'm still pulling up my link. Sorry about this. No, it's just... It's it's good to have, and it's kind of these stories are kind of funny. I remember there was one when I was in high school. I, I grew up in Arizona, so a Scottsdale kid actually made this whole entire video asking Kate Upton to prom. This was back That's in right. uh, two thousand twelve or 13, I can't remember, but it was a very well done video. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't over like retweets or a certain amount or goal. It was just the video, and I, she said yes, but I think there was something logistically with her that she she had prior engagements that day well any final thoughts before we uh we wrap up today Ryan? Well, i'm excited to see the tournament games here in milwaukee i'm actually heading over there right after oh, this got a, a long day two sessions um i'm excited to see purdue and vermont i think the catamounts have a little bit better chance than people think against purdue but i still think purdue is going to when that one, um, Butler here is in town again. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it would just be nice seeing all the people from, uh, from around the country coming to Milwaukee, going to the Bradley Center, catching some good basketball. I went to the practices yesterday, saw Minnesota, and uh, a lot of people in Gopher gear, a lot of people traveling. Um, 
Saw some Vermont gear as well. Nice to see them traveling out here. Put put the city on the map, on showcase here. We got the stage going. Uh, see how gracious of hosts we can be. All right. And um, we do actually have a, a comment from Kurt here on Facebook regarding the Le'Veon Bell story. Uh, he says, it's an interesting idea to have him there, but you can hear the rest of the student body not being happy, happy if it's all about him and not their prom. I, d- I feel like it's hard to be upset that there's an NFL player at your prom. I don't think it, he's... Unless you're not a big NFL person. You know, it's, then... it's still a celebrity. I mean, there could be a sure. movie star, and I mean, I'm not a big movie person. I think it, it's that's true. Okay, and then just keep to myself. But he, I'm sure he has a sense of responsibility that he's not going to take over the. It's not the Le'Veon Bell prom, right? It's the Waukesha East prom, and he he's got to know that at some level, and then it, it'll just be a fun time for everyone. It'll be nice. Oh. Le'Veon Bell over there uh, dancing around. I dance with Le'Veon Bell. That's something they could say. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think it's just going to be overall fun for everyone. All right. Well, thanks very much for, for yeah, being here, Ryan. Glad and to be here. We appreciated having you as my co-host today. You can find us uh, coming up. Uh, sorry about that. You can find us here next week on Thursday again for more Bubbler Banter. You can also go to BruceSportsNet.com. That'll show you all the shows that we have. You can find it on iTunes as a podcast as well. Thank you all so much for watching. You can find it on the YouTube channel. This has been Bubbler Banter on the Bruce Sports Network. I'm Josh Scheibe. He's Ryan Thies. Thanks very much. Have a good rest of your day.